our keynote speaker tonight has more that he needs to share with us, and he needed a little bit more time, so we had to tweak the agenda a little bit. We hope we don't we haven't offended you by coming in 15 minutes early, but we're so glad to have you here. I'm Bill Anderson with the College of Education, and on behalf of Dean McIntyre, who cannot be with us tonight due to illness, uh, I would like to welcome all of you to this very important conversation. The College of Education is very pleased to be leading this important uh, conversation, and I'd also at this time like to turn things over to Sean Long. Sean? Thank you, Bill. Uh, my name is Sean Long. I'm the Associate Dean for the Co Associate Dean for Academic Affairs in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Dean Nancy Gutierrez, who sends her regards. She's overseas. She's across the pond doing work, and the entire College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. At this time, we would like to like all elected officials to stand and be recognized. Thank you for your service. And now we would like to begin our program with Mr. Tom Hanchett, community historian. Welcome. On behalf of Levine Museum of the New South, we are so proud to once again join with UNC Charlotte and to co-sponsor uh, the program this evening. It's great to see so many folks here. Uh, I've been asked to talk some history, and so I'll do that for a little bit, uh, just for a couple of minutes. Um, the Brown versus Board of Education um, Supreme Court decision in 1954 um, said that it was time for us to desegregate our schools. That was 1954. Charlotte did not get around to doing anything until 1957, and in that it was similar to most other cities in the South. Um, a difference here is that um, unlike Little Rock where the National Guard was called out, um, here four students went into four different white schools, um, and there was no uh, real violence, um, but there was not, um, a nice greeting, to put it that way. Um, the most famous uh, person uh, in Charlotte was uh, Dorothy Counts, still a community activist. 14-year-old girl, went to Harding High School, uh, walked into uh, a mob, not a violent mob, but an ugly mob, and that photograph went around the world. Uh, it was a, a moment when Charlotte, I think, said to itself, that's not who we want to be. But it took a while to actually change. Uh, 1966, Charlotte still essentially uh, dual school systems, uh, few token black students in white schools. Julius Chambers, civil rights attorney uh, with a national reputation based in Charlotte, filed the case Swan versus Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools. And part of what it said was that segregation did not just happen. Segregation happened through a series of government and private decisions, particularly government decisions, government had an obligation to remedy that. And one possibility was in this town where north and west was African American, south and east was well-to-do and white, uh, put kids on buses. Uh, judge James McMillan, a white local judge, said yes, uh, you make a persuasive case, Attorney Chambers. And the case went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said yes as well. In 1971, Charlotte became the test case for court-ordered busing in the United States. Uh, that continued into the 1990s. In 1999, um, as the city grew quickly, um, as it was harder and harder to bus kids across town, as more and more people came who did not know why busing was going on, um, a new lawsuit was filed, and a new judge said that uh, the district was unitary, that the, the vestiges of that government created segregation were gone, um, and that henceforth from 1999, CMS could not use race in pupil assignment. So from that time to this, we've been working out what it means to have choice, neighborhood schools, whatever. There's now a much more complicated playing field in terms of magnet schools and charter schools and Montessori schools and as well as private schools and, and the uh, standard issue uh, public schools. Um, and so as we think today uh, about the things that we'll hear from Rucker Johnson, um, it is a, a different world uh, 
Uh, also a world in which, uh, as at Levine Museum in the New South, our new exhibit is Nuevo Lucian, Latinos in the New South. Uh, as recently as 1990, there were almost no foreign-born people in CMS, just a smattering. Um, today, um, Charlotte is the fastest growing major Latino metro in the United States. And it's not just Latino folks, it's folks coming from all over the world, English language learners in our schools. Um, so lots going on. If you want to find out more, uh, three exhibits out in the community that Levine Museum of the New South has um, partnered with folks to create. At the Ed School out at UNC Charlotte, there are some panels on the history of busing here in Charlotte. So if you're out at the Ed School, check that out. If you're up at Johnson C. Smith University, we did a national award-winning exhibit that's traveled uh, around the United States called Courage, the Carolina Story that Changed America. It's about Brown versus Board of Education, which surprisingly had roots in the Carolinas. Uh, the Delane family filed the first case coming out of South Carolina. They were run out of the state. They ended up living here in Charlotte, and their materials are the basis of that exhibit at Johnson C. Smith. And then we really invite you to come across the street to Levine Museum of the New South, uh, and we have, as part of our permitted exhibit, uh, one of the buses that was bought to implement the Swan decision and panels that talk about how the community came together uh, to make those changes and um, how things are continuing to change today. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's an honor to be here with you so that I can introduce Professor Rucker C. Johnson. He's an associate professor of public policy at the University of California, Berkeley, and a faculty associate in uh, the National Bureau of Economic Research. He received his PhD in economics from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. And in the past few years, he's received a number of fellowships, awards, and honors. His expertise is labor economics, urban economics, applied econometrics, and health economics. Instead of spending more time elaborating on his impressive biography, I want to spend a few minutes framing his remarks tonight in the context of several important historical and contemporary debates. As we know, as Dr. Hanschett has reminded us, the Supreme Court declared in Brown v. Board of Education that racially segregated schooling was inherently unequal and thus violated the Constitution. In the next five decades, through fits and starts, our nation largely desegregated public education. Initially, there was widespread resistance, especially in the southern states, but by the 70s, most states were compliant with Brown to some degree. Full implementation of Brown was complicated by subsequent political and judicial decisions that undercut it or uh, constrained what could be done to implement Brown and its, and its children. Uh, uh, and there was an uneven quality in the implementation of many desegregation uh, programs. Nonetheless, overall, levels of racial segregation declined when our nation uh, uh, was most desegregated. Race gaps in educational outcomes were the smallest in our nation's history. Beginning in the late 80s, US schools began to drift toward resegregation. And today, our public schools are almost as segregated as they were at the time of Brown. In our own time, the social context of school, uh, uh, schooling has changed because schools and students have shifted with many, many factors underlying the change. The demographic transformation of US society means we no longer have a largely black and white population. We are a technicolor nation and our schools reflect this reality. The achievement gap today is still exists, but family income inequality uh, is the driving force, much more so than race, so that income gaps in achievement and outcomes uh, exceed race gaps in 
achievement outcomes. The shifts in the spatial demography of our communities mean that children from all racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic backgrounds live in cities and suburbs. Today, every advanced society relies on schools to prepare all their youth for citizenship and the workplace in the shared, complex, multi-ethnic, globalizing, interconnected, post-industrial, increasingly technological world that we share. Nonetheless, there remains a fair amount of debate about whether school racial and socioeconomic segregation matter for s children's educational outcomes and then their lives beyond the school. If we can, if we can, let's put aside issues of racial justice, educational opportunity, and the morality of segregation. Let's simply ask two questions. Does the demographic composition of a school today make a difference in what goes on in it and with respect to the students' cognitive and non-cognitive outcomes? And second, and second if I can turn my page, is school diversity a policy goal that our leaders ought to consider? Professor Johnson's research addresses this larger debate of does it matter and the two questions in clear and powerful ways. And that's why he's here in Charlotte. So it is my great pleasure to present to you Professor Rucker C. Johnson, who will speak with us about his research on the grandchildren of Brown. So I'm just thrilled to be here with you, and I just want to first thank Roz for that such just very generous introduction. I really want to applaud the efforts of Bill Anderson, Dean McIntyre, as well as Amy Nelson and, and others um, who organized this great event. I think it, it speaks volumes about the engagement of Charlotte. It's a wonderful city, but you can tell that it is a wonderful community, and I'm thankful to have the time to share with you at a pivotal moment in the education policy history of Charlotte and in a pivotal moment that can provide a model for the way forward of many schools in this country. So to begin my remarks, I would ask that you would consider, what if I told you that we discovered keys that unlock children's potential and that when low-income children have access and use those keys, that it dramatically reduced their likelihood of staying in poverty, that it reduced their likelihood of dropping out of school, that it reduced their, that improved their health, that it reduced their likelihood of entering the criminal justice system or social welfare system. Would we not want to make that policy prescription available, as widely available as any vaccination against childhood disease? Well, we've discovered some of those keys. And yet, every now and then, we seem to lose the keys and need a policy locksmith to reopen closed doors and unlock opportunities. And so what I want to present to you is research from a larger book project that has investigated the first generation suite of equal education opportunity policies. The first among them, school desegregation, which has been described as the most controversial social experiments of the past 60 years. It was about equality of opportunity. It was followed by a litigation and series of school finance reform and legislative reforms to narrow spending gaps between rich and poor uh, districts. Again, school finance reform was one of the most dramatic changes in the structure of public education system. Finally, the rollout of early child education that first began with the rollout of Head Start under the War on Poverty initiatives. Again, 
another strategy. Now, each of these, school desegregation, school finance reform, Head Start, are connected in that they are different approaches that we have used to try to direct school resources intentionally to improve the educational opportunities for minority and poor children directly. And what's important about understanding them connected is that one had to do with redistributing school children and had to focus on race. One had to focus on redistributing money and had to focus on resource equity. One had to focus on starting early and redistributing the time of intervention. So we have a choice among, before us. Do we move school children? Do we move money? Do we move the timing of the intervention so that we're investing more in early child education in concert with the K through 12 spending? Or do we focus on things that have to do with redistributing parents through housing policy? Now, in school, you always were given a multiple choice, A, B, C, or D. Look for the E, all of the above. So what I want you to kind of follow is that what we need to do is have an understanding that this is not an either or, that tackling the issues of inequality of opportunity. There's a lot of conversation around budget deficits. Our attention should be focused on the deficit of opportunity facing our children. Now, just to motivate that, let me just provide a backdrop against which this sits, is that we have experienced significant rising and high economic inequality, much larger than other developed countries, and it has shifted the structure both of families, of labor markets, and the determinants of uh, success in the labor market. College has now become a precondition for upward mobility, okay? And our neighborhoods are more segregated than ever by class. I want to put before you that the most important threat to equal educational opportunity today is class. It interacts very strongly with race, but over the last 40 years, we have actually experienced and have a track record of tackling educational inequality. I want to provide a view into that based on the evidence that I'm going to present today. And what I want to highlight is simply that the black-white achievement gap has reduced by about 50% over this time period. And the largest gains in convergence of black-white achievement occurred during the period of desegregation and re school resource equalization. Now, we have dropped the ball on continuing that progress, but it has also been challenged by the subsequent increase in economic inequality. And now, the achievement gap by class is two times the achievement gap by race. And so we have to shift to the changing demographics and the changing challenges of our day. But we must do so with, armed with the lessons of yesterday into our transition forward. So this work that I'm going to present today is, I would say, distinctive in its distinguished by its scale, scope, and investigation strategies for uncovering the causal impacts of groundbreaking legislation designed to improve and direct school resources to minority and poor children. A significant portion of prior evidence has focused on these topics using individual outcomes, using smaller selective populations, narrower sets of outcomes. What the book contributes is a encompassing panoramic investigation, an aerial view but with detail using generationally linked, nationally representative data, longitudinally linked to investigate a broad set of outcomes spanning a substantial share of the life course. And one of the goals of this research in its totality is to form a coherent picture of desegregation's impacts and integration's full effects on individuals, and thereby understand the extent and nature of segregation's broad consequences for society. Now, in this effort, I'm bringing new data to age-old debates. And what that requires is a, I'm going to be using data as a time machine and bring you back to the future of education policy. So what I want you to consider is we're getting in the DeLorean together <laughs> on this trip, and I want you to consider yourself Michael J. Fox 
and consider me your mad scientist. And the whole goal of this is to bring us back to what it means for today. Now, one of the big moments of this conversation is about we pride ourselves on being a land of opportunity. When we consider the fact that the evidence from the US is that there's substantial persistence in economic status across generations. When we look at children born into the bottom quintile of the childhood distribution and follow them into adulthood, what do we find? We find that 42% of them stay in the bottom quintile in their generation. We find that only 8% rise to the top quintile. Those rates of upward mobility are far lower than other developed countries. What we want to do in the more recent evidence that has begun to shed light on the nature and determinants of this upward mobility prospects has been fueled by research by my colleagues Raj Chetty, as well as my Berkeley colleagues uh, Emmanuel Saez and Patrick Klein, in which they look at the geography of opportunity by not looking at this aggregate mobility rates, but looking in detail and creating a detailed picture using 40 million linked um, income records intergenerationally linked to demonstrate the connection between parental income and children's adult income and to examine how mobility rates differ across geography. And what they found was a dramatic variation where we have pockets, almost two different societies, some pockets of communities with very fluid upward mobility trajectories and very many others where being poor as a child becomes more of a life sentence of having reduced opportunity in adulthood of becoming, um, have more upward mobility prospects. So when we look at this map that they produced, what we see, the darker shades of red represent places that are more um, immobile. So the lighter colors are the places where there's more mobility across generations. So what you see in the lighter colors is if you're born to the bottom quintile, basically at the 25th percentile of income, your chance of in adulthood on average to rise above the median is very high. Um, on the other hand, the likelihood that you remain poor for the, the darker shades is very, very much some of the lowest levels of upward mobility that we've seen from any other country. So typically we do cross country comparisons in the mobility literature. There's actually much more to learn by looking at the within United States distribution of upward mobility. And if it was immutable, we would not see the geographic variation that we do. What it points to is that policy can make a difference. Okay? And what I just want to highlight to you is if you look at the top 10 cities of highest upward mobility, one of the things that you're going to see in common, other than Salt Lake City, is that many of these cities are diverse, but they also have more integrated school environments for children. The inequality that emerges actually emerges very early, which suggests school policy and education policy is one of the key vehicles to upward mobility. In this list, you see I'm coming from the Bay Area, so you can certainly see some of my cities represented, San Jose, San Francisco, um, I, I'm from Minneapolis. I grew up in Minneapolis, number eight. We also see Boston. So those are school communities that have invested both early and have higher expenditures throughout the K through 12 years, but also have lower levels of uh, segregation, which can compromise equal educational opportunity. Our geography of opportunity is very structured by race and class. Now, if we go to the other side, as vibrant an economy as Charlotte has been, as much as it's been able to attract some of the best and brightest to this community, it is the lowest right now of cities that if you're born into poor, disadvantaged backgrounds, the upward mobility prospects are shown to be among the lowest of any other major urban area. What we want to do is understand how Charlotte, once a national beacon of both opportunity and integration, has lapsed into a resegregation mode, but that this community has seized the opportunity to turn it around. And so what I want to just say is when we look at the cities from Detroit to Atlanta to Charlotte to New Orleans to Nashville, Columbus, Cincinnati, one of the things that stands out is those cities have some hyper-segregated areas. 
in which both poor and minority children are concentrated with inferior access to school quality resources and um, not sufficient investments in the early childhood years. So in that, I want to build you a frame for thinking about what this means for us, but with lens for data outside of Charlotte, but a national picture so that you can understand that the challenges we face are not new, but we've also made some discoveries of what can be done. So again, the first chapters of the book kind of focus on the long run impacts of school desegregation. Now you want to think of generationally linked as there were the children of segregation. That's kind of my parents' generation. Those who were born before 1950 generally were, went to all segregated schools throughout their school age years. Then you have the children of desegregation. That's more my cohort. Okay? Then you have the children of resegregation. That's the cohorts that have been born since 1985. Then you have the children of choice, this more recent era of school voucher, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what we're trying to say is we're trying to link these eras. And the first point of this is to look at the first cohort era of children that were born between 1945 and 1970 who've been followed into adulthood, who are now in their 40s and 50s, and we're able to observe their entire life trajectories and identify what aspects of their life chances were influenced by access to quality schools. Now, who's on the bus, schools as a vehicle to intergenerational mobility is a focal point of how mobility prospects were shaped by these early childhood education and K through 12 policies. In concert, we understand that it's not just school desegregation from a racial lens, but it's about school resource equalization, which is about access to quality schools, quality teachers, um, access to curricular activities. There's a whole host of aspects of school resource equalization that's beyond the money, but it's about the social capital. It's about the parental involvement. It, it's a community effort. The old adage that it takes a village could not be more acute, uh, certain here. But in chapter three, or the third part of the book project is about looking at how school finance reforms as a policy vehicle to level or equalize spending, what impacts it had on subsequent outcomes of children, and starting in the early years, so preschool investments as well as K through 12. And one of the highlights here is that not only do educational investments in the K through 12 years matter, but that there's particular synergies of impacts in the health realm, hospital desegregation, early child prenatal care, early child preschool programs that lead a set of disadvantaged children to enter kindergarten more school ready and to be able to take advantage in more effective ways of the school investments that are created in the K through 12 years. That if we think we can start late, recognizing that the achievement gap, half of it, is already present by kindergarten. So we have to understand that these things predate kindergarten entry, and therefore, the timing of intervention must begin early. Those are there. Then we want to move forward. OK, that was the cohorts born before 1985. It's important to understand the long run consequences before kind of uh, outcomes just like test scores and our infatuation with just a focus on narrow test score, but looking at long-term attainments as the yardsticks of school performance. So I do that, but then we want to kind of bring it up to current. So we look at the grandchildren of Brown. These are cohorts born since 1980, mostly focused on children who have completed uh, who are at least reach age 18, and we can observe their outcomes, and we're examining what way in which their parents' access to better schooling affected the children's ability to provide for their children and then uh, translate those um, beneficial uh, economic as well as educational settings to pass on to the next generation. What do we see there? And there I find that not only did desegregation have impacts on that first generation that went from segregated to integrated schools, that was the largest convergence of the black-white gap we've seen to date, but also that it persisted into the third generation. Now what I want you to appreciate about each of these policy levers, from school desegregation, school finance reform, and Head Start, they have one thing in common their effects were not well documented early on. And it led to a perception, a false one, that those policies don't work. And what I just want to uh, emphasize 
is that policies that go undocumented in their benefits, an undocumented beneficial program is like an ineffective one. Because unless it's documented, it will be perceived as only the cost of the program. And the benefits associated will be ignored. So what's important from the research community, but also engagement with the broader school community and voters and the public, is to understand that we have to be about documenting and monitoring whether our efforts are working. Without that, there's very little that we're going to do to affect sustained and replicable change. Now, the last piece of this is to look at, well, what have been the educational consequences of our resegregation that often accompanied the end of court-ordered desegregation and how the legal landscape and contemporary education policy has shifted. So that will be the last pillar that I'll try to tread. I have a large terrain to try to cover. I'll try to speak quickly, but in a way that's digestible and in a way that helps us to back up from all of this and say, well, what does it mean for Charlotte and what does it mean for today? Are we okay? All right, so there's four stages of the analysis. The first begins with the early, kind of from segregated to integrated schools. What impacts did it have? And in order to pursue that, you have to look at non-racial aspects of integration to be able to examine how did court-ordered school desegregation influence the quantity and quality of educational inputs received by minority children. In order to do that, I acquired the largest comprehensive database of court litigation efforts that we've ever uh, pulled together, dating back from 1954 to 2000, every known court order desegregation court case, its timing, its litigation history, what type of desegregation plan was put in place, coupled with linking it to um, school district panel data at the district level of school spending dating back to 1962 and annual data from 1970 to 2000, okay, 10. So I use that together to then try to look at how Different policies affected the distribution of spending, class size, per pupil spending, teacher quality, teacher salary, et cetera. Then we go on because that informs what was the policy itself. How did it affect school inputs? And then we want to look at the effectiveness of those changes in school inputs on longer term outcomes, not just test scores, but most importantly, educational attainment, high school graduation rates, earnings, adult economic status, et cetera, even health, okay? And What's going to be important is that we have to be able to isolate the impacts of school policy as apart from other competing factors that influence children's trajectories, most importantly parental family background as well as neighborhood background. Okay? All of that's going to put me in a position to be able to show effects for intergenerational returns of education policy. So just to foreshadow where we're going, these are the first estimates of court-ordered school desegregation impacts on adult earnings, adult health, intergenerational mobility. I'm using first the variation in the timing of court-ordered school desegregation implemented during the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and then I'm using that to then contrast different um, trajectories of outcomes. In addition to improvements in educational and economic outcomes, they're mirrored also in long-run improvements in adult health that um, are being transmitted through the close connection between education and subsequent health trajectories. A big part of this comes through not just the education reforms, but working in concert with preschool investments as well as health investments from hospital desegregation as well as preschool interventions. Okay? Now, you want to remember the 1960s is a miracle in policymaking. Sometimes it's helpful to go back to periods where we actually had more hope in the potential of policy to make a difference, okay? <laughs> just saying, just saying, okay? But in this period, we faced some serious challenges, but we rose to the occasion with the Economic Opportunity Act, the Civil Rights Act of 64, 68, the Food Stamp Act, amendments to Social Security Act, Medicare, Medicaid. There was no other period in our history where equal education policy was not more fertile. The question is, what did those investments achieve in the early years of their enactment? That's Part of what I'm trying to do, but it also is to showcase that in order to isolate the education effects, you have to be confident that you're not instead picking up these effects that are also independently important. Okay? So I have a way to do that, but as we said with the time machine, we got to go back in the time period that we start. 1960 is where we're going to start here, and you can see the concentration of poverty. Okay? These are county poverty rates, but the 300 poorest counties are almost all in the south. And they are also levels of concentrated poverty that are far beyond what we experience today. We're talking about in red 
counties where more than 45% of the households are in poverty, okay? Now, when you overlay the, the poverty concentration with the concentration of where African Americans were in that time period, again, this is kind of in advance of major migrations to other parts of the country, you also see why the South was a kind of clear place in which a lot of the judicial landmarks of school desegregation would be waged. Okay, now you want to think about where did we start? 1952, on the eve of the Brown um, kind of outlaw of, uh, of, uh, of a Jim Crow system, what, what we see is legal segregation required throughout the South, including the District of Columbia. We see in green, legal segregation permitted, yellow, legal segregation prohibited, and in purple, violet, no specific legislation on segregation. So there's a clear regional pattern. That's going to be important to think about how it is that we make sure we're not picking up regional time trends and thinking that that's really the effects of desegregation. So we want to kind of consider that these were landmark cases, but at the same time, through the first decade after Brown, there was no major actual implementation of school desegregation plan integration efforts. So as one put it, the pace between 54 and 62 was not at all. Most of the kind of acceleration happened in 64 to 1970, so that by 72, the South is actually among the most integrated than the rest of the country. And What's important about that is the Civil Rights Act of 1964 put teeth in enforcement, and that was a pivotal moment tied to the financial incentives of compliance that happened with the uh, Federal Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965. But what you can certainly see is that as late as 1964, less than 5% of black children were in majority white schools, and that didn't increase until after 1964, and it increased pretty sharply. So when we look at periods of desegregation, there's kind of, I'm a kind of child life course perspective person, so I always have to put things back in life course perspective, but desegregation, neonatal intensive infancy period, the adolescence was the coming of age period, the young adulthood period, that's where we reached a peak integration in 1988, we we're at the peak levels, and since we've really drifted back to the levels of segregation back to the, the mid-70s. Okay, so what I want to kind of first say, again, is to highlight that these didn't happen miraculously and not right away, okay? That it's been described that the pace of integration in these early years was one of an extraordinarily arthritic turtle, okay? So when you look at the evidence and mapping the timing, and the timing is going to be key, but 54, this is where we started, every part in red represents a place where there was actually some desegregation plan in place. By 59, five years after Brown, it's still not a lot of red there. By 63, certainly Alabama came under attack. We know about all the riots there, but certainly still not a lot of activity. By 70, though, and remember, the Swan is 1971, the first kind of use of busing as an instrument here. By 1975, by 1990, when we're at peak integration levels, this many school desegregation plans have been in enacted. So that timing actually becomes critical for me to contrast communities that were early adopters of desegregation. Remember, the NAACP pursued a strategy to pursue litigation where they thought they had the highest chance to win, not necessarily where it would increase black outcomes the most or Hispanic outcomes the most. So the timing, again, the birth cohort timing means that you have some cohorts that were exposed throughout their school age years in the kind of cohorts born in the early 70s versus the all segregated cohorts are certainly the, the older generation born between, before 1950. That's going to be a central part of how I identify these effects. So let's move forward to look at, well, what effects did it have on school quality? That's the first order question before we look at adult attainments. To do this, I link three generations of adult outcomes. This is done with the panel study of income dynamics, which is the longest running panel data set in the world. I use the residential address histories from birth to adulthood. Um, these initial ge generation of cohorts I examined were born between 1945 and 1968. I'm linking the addresses to the census block and matching it with the school district boundaries that prevailed in the late 60s. Um, we're talking about 9,156 individuals, children, that were growing up in districts that at some point went under, uh, that underwent a court-ordered desegregation plan. 
645 districts subject to court order in 448 counties, 39 states. The oversample of blacks and minority, um, blacks, minorities, and low-income families enables me to have sufficient power. We're talking about 4,600, 4,618 blacks and matching them to the school district boundaries. Now, the key thing is I'm not just matching it to the school district boundaries, but a number of other policies that happen at the same time to be able to account for things. Now, the thought experiment you want to have for the methodology about why I'm confident that these other results are impacts is you want to consider it's like looking at two children from the same district, okay? But they, one was already 18 at the time of the policy change. Sometimes I'm talking about a policy change that relates to school desegregation. Other times I'm going to be talking about a policy change that relates to school finance reform. But in either case, I'm talking about two people, one who was already 18 before it was enacted. I call those pre-treatment cohorts. And then I have another set who were from the same district, but it happened because they were born later. It happened during their school age years. So they are actually exposed to the policy. What I'm examining is, do post-reform cohorts have better outcomes than pre-reform cohorts? And when you think about the treatment, you need to think about the dosage. So the dosage of the treatment is influenced by the duration of exposure in the school age years, but also the magnitude of the intervention. And so I'm looking at our improvements across cohorts, larger in districts that underwent larger changes in per-pupil spending, class size, school improvement inputs, okay? And then I'm looking to see if these are really truly a, a reflection of the impacts of school policy, then I should only see impacts if it occurred that overlaps your school age years, not other years. So the idea is you're looking at the year that you turn age 17 minus the year of the school reform. Whenever that difference is negative, it represents people who are 18, 19, 20, for example, when the policy actually went in place. So they were not exposed because they were older than school age years when it occurred. But then you have some that were partially exposed. That is, it happened at some point during their school age years. And I'm looking for patterns, at least if consistent with a causal effect, that when it happens, the longer you're exposed, I see a dose treatment response so that not only do your outcomes improve with more years of exposure, but if the reform led to more spending increases and more improvements in school inputs, that we see larger improvements in adult outcomes. And finally, obviously, the largest, the longest time you could be exposed is 13 years, including kindergarten. So I shouldn't see that like forever, forever, OK? But I'm looking at the school age years in particular. Are we OK? So let me just show you what the results look like. We're talking about 1,057 districts that implemented desegregation plans. We're talking about looking at adult outcomes um, before and after the intervention based on where you grew up and comparing children from the exact same district controlling for family background and other differences. Okay? So there's a whole lot of family background factors, family structure, birth weight, health insurance coverage, parental education, parental health behaviors, uh, a whole host of neighborhood factors, a whole host of other coincident policies from Head Start spending to Title I spending to AFDC, to the safety net expenditures. Those are all things that matter too, but those are all being controlled and accounted for so that I can focus on the effects of the school policy. Okay? So effects of, on segregation, let's just start from the beginning. If you look at the pre-existing time trend, there's no significant pre-existing time trend. We're talking about a black-white dissimilarity index, which, which is the most commonly used segregation indice. It captures what proportion of black children would have to move to another school within the district for there to be racial balance. Before the intervention, it was 0.8, saying 80% of black children would have to move to another school within the district for there to be racial balance. Okay. Now, just note, Charlotte now is getting closer to like 0.7, so we used to be better. Now we've kind of went back, but here, let me just show you what, we, what was back in this period. We see a 25 percentage point reduction in the black-white dissimilarity index after court orders. Remember also, most of the integration efforts did not occur in, in terms of major effects without the court order. Okay? Now, you see that? Let's look at some non-racial aspects of integration in terms of school resource equalization. Here, for minority children, you see a significant increase, no pre-existing time trend, but a significant increase in access to school spending for black children after desegregation court orders. Now, this is because, particularly in the South, a majority of school district spending was allocated to the majority white schools. 
And therefore, the school resource equalization that accompanied desegregation allowed minority children to have access to more school quality inputs. We're talking about a 20 percentage point increase throughout the school age years between cohorts that were exposed to desegregation court orders throughout their school age years compared to previous cohorts from those same districts that were already 18 before the intervention. Okay, so those are huge increases that then led to significant declines in class size for African Americans with no change for whites. Now the reason no change for whites is because the state infused dollars to desegregated districts to level up spending to the levels whites were already getting. So that whites would kind of be left unaffected and there would be an equalization that would increase the inputs available to black children. So we see a significant reduction in class size for blacks. Now the point is, well what affects on later life outcomes? So the first is educational attainment. We see no pre-existing time trend, but with each year of exposure to desegregated schools, we see almost a full year increase in years of completed education, okay? And what we also see is that those gains did not come at the expense of whites. So for whites, we see that they overlapped African Americans in the pre-existing time trend, but that we don't see any negative or positive effects, at least in educational attainment, for whites. So there was a significant narrowing of black-white educational gaps that came through this increased access to quality schools. Okay? Now what you want to remember about desegregation is I have like three or four major mechanisms in mind. You may have even more, but my main mechanisms in mind about why school desegregation could have these larger effects is because of the way it affected school resource equalization, class size for people spending, et cetera, but also it could come through higher teacher quality. Okay? It could come through also peer effects, that is when children are in schools with more highly motivated children, but also when there's a less concentration of poverty, that it can improve the school functioning, excuse me. The other piece is that school interventions can affect parental, teacher, and community level expectations for child achievement. Those are mechanisms that I want to parse out so I can understand what led to these improvements. Now, when you look at high school graduation rates, you see a similar mechanism, or a similar set of patterns, no pre-existing time trend, but with almost a 20 percentage point increase in the likelihood of graduating from high school when you compare those cohorts that were never exposed to integrated schools versus African Americans who were exposed to integrated schools throughout their K through 12 years, okay? Controlling for other birth cohort trends, and again, no effects for whites. Okay? Now you see a similar pattern when we look at adult earnings, so I'm going to go through these quite quickly, but the point is the patterns of educational improvements are mirrored in significant improvements in educational attainment, such that for five years of exposure to integrated schools led to a 25% increase in adult earnings. These are huge narrowing of gaps in adult outcomes by race. Finally. We're always interested in what policies can reduce the intergenerational transmission of poverty. Here again, no pre-existing time trend, but a 20 percentage point decline in the annual incidence of poverty in adulthood when you compare cohorts that were exposed to integrated schools throughout their school age years versus cohorts that were never exposed or were 18 when it occurred in their school district of upbringing. Again, no effects for whites, okay? So finally, we wanna know did these have any impacts on other dimensions of well-being? Health, at the end of the day, is some of our most prized uh, asset. You know, we want to live long, and one of the things that we see is no pre-existing time trend, but significant improvements in adult health. Not because child health necessarily improved, though child health did improve because of hospital desegregation, but most of these effects are just because of the strong connection between socioeconomic status and determining future health trajectories in terms of what neighborhoods you live in and what other healthcare access that you have, okay? Now, the point of all of this is to say there are a lot of social consequences to failing schools, and one of them is those children that fail in school are more likely to take up other life of crime, criminal involvement. So what I also show is these investments early then lead to much lower criminal involvement later in life. So you see no pre-existing time trend, again, a 20 percentage point decline in the likelihood of ever being incarcerated, jail, prison, criminal record, et cetera, okay, with no effects for whites, okay. 
Finally, we say, well, why these outcomes? Those are earlier cohorts, but why those outcomes? What's the mechanism? Again, I look at resources versus peer effects, and what I find is that the lion's share of the driving impact was driven by the school resource equalization mechanism, okay? And that led to a more dramatic narrowing of gaps than just peer exposure or school integration without a change in actual school resources. Okay? Now, school desegregation doesn't really permit the greatest lens just to tackle the question of does money matter? So I turn to the school finance reform literature more directly to look at how money matters. Certainly, there are lessons to be learned from school desegregation in that context, but school finance reform was directly related to how funding and how school resources matter. So what you want to understand about school finance reform is the judicial landmarks of school desegregation court cases were structured in a way that the litigation around school finance reform provided a wave of that next generation wave of litigation where the argument that school proponents, litigators made was that the strong connection between community wealth and the ability to raise revenue for schools because of our distinguished history of the majority of school funding coming from the local property tax base was violating an equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution or the relevant state constitution. So with that, there was 45 states that underwent some kind of litigation around the constitutionality of their laws governing how school resources are distributed. 28 of them were overturned in favor of some funding formula change and almost every state over since 1970 has engaged in some type of major funding formula change that has led to a major narrowing of spending gaps between poor and non-poor or rich and more poor and more affluent communities. And what we do, this is joint with Carabo Jackson Northwestern, what we do is build an entire case inventory of every known timing of court ordered legislative school finance reform, the type of funding formula change, and link that with micro level data, again, to document what effects school spending had. Now, we get a lot of the data comes from a lot of different places in the interest of time. I'm, I'm not going to pain you with this painstaking detail effort that was required to assemble the data, but the main point is just to say we have nationally representative data for the whole universe of school districts and their experience after pre-post school finance reform. All school finance reforms, though, are not created equal. So what the design features of the programs actually is essential in making a policy work in narrowing gaps versus not. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm not going to kind of go through the different funding formula types, but it is important in the ways that it has affected funding streams for schools that have affected outcomes for kids. Okay? But the main point is the way we go about isolating impacts of school spending is first showing there's no pre-existing time trend before the school finance reform mandate, and then we use the timing of the court mandated school finance reform to show that if you're a poor district, it tended to increase your spending by about 20 percentage points. I mean, 20% relative to pre-existing levels. But if you were a affluent district, it basically didn't change your spending very much. And so depending on the district income or wealth, it affected the level of spending. And we use that in the jargon of econometrics as an instrumental variable to isolate variation in spending that's otherwise unrelated to family background and neighborhood background so that we can say, does money matter? Now here, for that analysis, it's a similar design, but I'm looking at older, um, younger cohorts because I want to look at the cohorts that actually straddle when school finance reform litigation actually occurred. So these are cohorts born between 55 and 1985, but again, who've been followed through 2013. We're talking about 15,353 individuals. Um, we're talking about from 1,409 districts, over 1,031 <coughs> childhood counties, representing all 50 states, okay? So certainly, North Carolina is in here. But the main point is just to show first that we find significant impacts. Let's just look at educational attainment, for example. So one of the, the deficits of the previous literature in this vein is it does matter how you spend the money. So we could say, does money matter? But it does matter. If you don't spend it on the right things, money can not necessarily matter. So the fact that money is not used wisely 
does not necessarily mean money doesn't matter. It means how you spent it may have negated its influence, okay? But so what we do is not only say how much money does a district have, but how did they allocate it among the productive inputs? Class size reduction. Remember, 80% of a school budget is teachers. So do you hire better teachers? Do you have higher teacher salary? Do you enable the money to go to the teachers that can lead to reductions in class size? Well, we find with court-mandated school finance reform, a lot of those resources made it to the classroom. They didn't get tied up in school administrative salaries. They didn't get tied up with just building new buildings. It's the human capital learning enterprise that we're trying to examine how funding impacts. So we do that. We then show that because of it affecting school inputs, leading to longer school years, smaller class sizes, higher teacher salaries to attract a higher quality teacher work workforce, what we then show is that those impacts had dramatic impacts, particularly for poor children. Not so much impacts for middle class and upper middle class families, but you remember, those from more upper middle class families, what do they do when they don't like the school system? They move, okay? They vote with their feet. But what do poor district, what do poor families have access to? Not that choice. So what I'm saying is when you see the impacts and they're concentrated for poor families, it's because they're more sensitive to what the actually policy, local policy frame is. Okay, what you see is an increase in educational attainment. This is basically for a 20% increase in spending throughout the school age years. Leads to an additional year of educational attainment. You know, the results vacillate, but there's a statistically significant impact. No impacts if, you know, basically it didn't lead to spending increases. Okay. And if you look at the difference between, just to gauge the magnitudes, the average difference in years of completed schooling between poor children and non-poor children is about one year. Okay? That means that the estimated implied effects are that a 20% increase in spending on average could eliminate the educational gap between rich and poor children on average. If you look at the gap by high school graduation rates, again, the baseline rate you can see is like 78% for low-income children. It's about 93% for uh, non-poor children, and you can see it closed significantly. This represents a 10% per pupil spending increase throughout the school age years, okay? So a big part of funding equity can facilitate the closing of gaps. We actually have a strong record on that. The next point is to say you can't do it all in the K through 12 years. So what do you have to do to augment the efficacy of that spending in the K through 12 years? I say start early. The preschool years is central. This is just a picture of Head Start in the very early years. So I adjoin these K through 12 school finance reform spending effects with the investments we made in pre-K so that we could look at how did Head Start spending have synergistic impacts with the K through 12 spending. Okay, again, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna like go through all the details, but the main point is the rollout of Head Start, these are the 300 poorest counties in red. Okay, remember, they're mostly all in the south. Charlotte might be in there, though. I don't know my geography that well, okay? Okay, but the main point is what you're going to see in terms of the rollout of, my dad was a historian and geography teacher, so he would be kind of like, you should know this, okay? <laughs> but anyways, but Head Start spending 1965, 66. Okay, this is no Head Start preschool. This means, like, if there's no Head Start in your community, in this era, kids are not going to preschool. They're staying at home. Okay? Now, in the more contemporary period, if you don't get into a public preschool, you're going to another one. That's not the case in this era. Okay? They also usually don't have pediatric care. Head Start has a major component, not just to enhance cognition, not just to enhance literacy, numeracy, problem solving, reasoning, decision making, non-cognitive com competencies, but it has a major pediatric care component. And it's to enhance cognition and nutrition. Okay? Those investments are central for school readiness. What we find, this is 1966, the blue is where there's a Head Start Center. So we went from no to 66, 67, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, all the way to 1980, okay? Now the point is, I'm using the timing of the rollout of Head Start and the subsequent investments in Head Start that happened through the first 15 years of the program so that I can basically compare two children from the same exact county, but one child at age four there was no Head Start Center in there. They were only born a few years earlier, but there was no Head Start Center available. I'm contrasting their developmental trajectories through life. Okay? 
Now, the key thing people kind of overlook is this is a very disadvantaged population. Think about what Head Start accomplished even in the first two years on health just alone. 98,000 eye defects treated, 900,000 cases of dental problems, five cavities per child, not 740,000 without polio vaccinations who received the vaccine, a million given measles vaccinations. If you think for your life that that didn't somehow affect what happens in the school environment, think again, it matters, okay? Now, what I'm saying here, though, is that there's a lot of concern that Head Start fades out, okay? The concern, though, for me is, why does Head Start fade out? The benefits fade out if they go to K-12 school environments that aren't supportive of those early childhood educational investments. So what I do is I examine not just the Head Start spending, but whether they subsequently attend to K-12 school environments where they're getting access to quality schools. And what I find is the fade out is much more dramatic when they subsequently attend K-12 schools of lower spending on average. But instead, when they attend schools that have an infusement of educational investments, in other words, the potential of early childhood interventions is still dependent on the successive quality of subsequent investments. It's not an either or, it's an and, and, okay? All of the above. So the research design here exploits the geographic expansion of Head Start programs, it's spending. In the interest of time, I'm just kind of giving you an idea of what I'm doing here. But again, residentially immobile families were usually able to enroll their younger child, but not their older child. So I even do sibling comparisons just to demonstrate that this is indeed policy-induced differences. I'm comparing children in areas in which Head Start is not available with areas in which it becomes available. And it's that changing a bail. Oh, that's not good. Can you help me? I must have pushed something. OK, thank you. So let me, let me try to talk to you while, while that's going on so we don't waste time. OK, so the main point as this is coming up is that I had already documented that school spending matters. And it matters more for poor kids. Okay? But also, what I find here is that when the preschool investments happen, that the actual effectiveness of the K-12 spending is enhanced. That is, it's not the same as adding up the sum of the beneficial impact of Head Start spending with the sum of the K-12 spending. If you add that sum, it doesn't equate to the total effect of both. That is, the total is more than the sum of the individual parts. And the reason that's the case is because there's a synergistic impact of you invest early, and it allows those opportunities to enable children to become more school ready when they enter school. And then when there's quality investments in the K through 12 years, they're able to take advantage of those opportunities in a much more effective manner that leads to a greater closing of achievement gaps and later life success than if we did either by themselves. Okay, now. Sorry, we, the whole system shut down. Okay, so, but <laughs> follow me. Help me. Okay. So, I'm not making it up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, but, 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 but it's not the case that, um, you know, this has to be strategic. If we continue to have preschool in its own box, and we have K-12 discussions in a separate box, and they never talk to each other, there's no forum like this, like we're going to be kind of like on separate paths with common objectives. What we're interested in is not having the health providers in a whole separate conversation, having the housing policy folk who know how to kind of help fuse together more integrated schooling be in some separate room, and the education leaders in this other room, like we need everybody at the table because the issues of inequality require not a collection of policies, but a collaboration of policies. Thank you. So, um, thank you. So, like I said, I know that we're, we're, we're short on time, so I'm really going to try to um, just get to the punchline so that we can get into the panel discussion. Um, the thing I'm going to turn to in the interest of time is what does it mean for the next generation? We're going to just kind of go through these quite quickly because I want to get to well, what does it mean for the next generation. But the one point I just wanted to say. Okay, sorry about that, thank you. Okay, so when we look at the interactive effects, again, this is on educational attainment for poor children. If they have an increase in Head Start spending of $1,000, 
but it's in a subsequent K through 12 school environment that's below average spending, we see a pretty modest effect, okay? When we see them subsequently attend schools of higher spending, on average spending, we see an increased effect of Head Start spending. When it's in a district that has 10% above average, we see an even larger impact on educational attainment. What's important is if we do K through 12 spending increases, we see that a 10% increase in K through 12 spending leads to about a 0.6 increase in educational attainment for poor children. But if we do it in concert with pre-K, okay, then it's more like 0 0.7, 0 0.74. These are huge differences in magnitude that say the total is bigger than the sum of the parts. Okay? We see similar effects for high school graduation rates. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to show you all of them. But just to show you, first, if we do a $1,000 increase in Head Start spending and a 10% increase in Head Start and K-12 spending throughout the school age years, and we do that in succession, we see that it actually increases high school graduation rates by like 20 percentage points. Those are huge impacts. And we're comparing children from the same district. Okay, so there's more to say on different pieces of this, but I want to turn to discussions of the next generation outcomes. So again, when you look at spending for adult wages, you see similar patterns of narrowing of gaps. But in the interest of time, I'm not going to show you all of those. Okay? I guess maybe I'll show you one just to say <laughs> the poverty piece. Okay? So if you do look at poverty, intergenerational poverty reduction, you see that if we do the spending, it reduces the annual incidence of poverty and adulthood by 10 percentage points. And if we do it with the Head Start spending, we lead to an additional 12 percentage points total. Um, so again, those are big impacts in reducing poverty. I'm not showing you health, and I'm not showing you an incarceration. But I will say, some of our most best crime-preventing crime policies and health-promoting policies are not in health care. They're not in criminal justice. They're in education, in early education. Okay? So. So let's just try to look at the legacy generation to generation. Because ultimately, the whole mission of the early kind of excavation of the lessons from the former policies of the past is to inform the way forward. So one way I first do that is to look at the children of the grandchildren of Brown, the children of the parents that I had already documented had these really big impacts on their educational attainment and on their adult outcomes. Okay? And in the Grandchildren of Brown chapter of the book, I then use this three generations of adult outcomes linked, but I provide evidence on how the parents' exposure to integrated schools in their childhood periods affected the next generation, their children's subsequent educational performance in schools, okay? via, again, the timing of the initial court orders. And what I find is that these impacts persisted into the, the third generation. Okay? So there's no pre-existing time trend of high school graduation rates among children whose parents were never exposed to integrated schools. It's a statistically insignificant pre-existing time trend. But for parents, children, the likelihood of graduating from high school okay, is significantly related to the years of exposure their parents had to integrated schools. Okay? And it's because those integrated schools allowed those parents to achieve higher educational attainment, have higher earnings, have lower poverty rates, and they were able to transmit that advantage to their children's childhood conditions to enable greater mobility for their children. Okay? So the consequences of our failure to invest are generational in nature. We can reverse a whole generation's progress or advance it with our tools of policy. Now, again, if we do the same comparison for whites, there's no real effects for whites. But remember before, I said there was no real school resource input changes for whites. There was no for the parents' generation. And so it's not surprising that their children were not as affected. But there is a prevailing wisdom that school integration is a zero-sum game, that the, the gains for minority groups or the gains to diversity only help minority children. That's actually a paradigm I'm challenging but I'm not quite there yet, okay? So let's look at the considerable impacts of school desegregation to next generation. And next, 
we want to say, that was then. Is it now? Okay? And here, what I really want to kind of at least have you think on is the fact that even in some of our great integrated schools, some of our magnet programs, okay, the nature of desegregation and the nature of integration has changed quite a bit. Okay? So even when we have what looks like ostensibly integration, the way segregation propagates itself is sometimes through the tracking. And at early ages, before children can actually demonstrate their potential, we've already decided that you don't really look like you might have the ability. I think that's not a good idea. And you can see, <laughs> I want to question, question that. But I think if you go and interrogate the curricular offerings and who's in those classrooms, we see a clear demarcation along race and class lines that begins so early in the school age career that it's hard to justify along ability margins. Remember, the distribution of achievement is not the same as the distribution of ability. Don't get it confused. Okay? So what we want to do is kind of understand how these things operate. And I want to say one thing about how segregation operates differently. Most of it today is actually between district. So while Charlotte Mecklenburg County Schools and it has consolidated because of the 1959 decision to consolidate four types of schools, it was white county, white city, black county, black city, and they made a decision, a crucial decision that's helpful for today to say, we're not going the fragmentation route. We're going to be all in this together. And that's why they became a beacon of national example of what desegregation can look like. Okay? Now it's kind of what can happen if we're not sensitive to ensuring that that goes forward. So when we say moving away from desegregation, the contemporary legal landscape is such that beginning in 1990, there was three major Supreme Court decisions that eased districts from being under court mandated and basically declared that court mandated desegregation was no longer going to be in the interest of school districts and that districts shouldn't really be under those kinds of, of things. And what it did was it led to a resegregation of schools, okay? Because we were still dealing with a housing residential segregation that was just as segregated as before and economic segregation has increased. So there has been more than 200 districts dismissed from court orders released from court orders. In Charlotte, Mecklenburg, it happened, I think, in 2001. Their kind of busing plan first changed in 1991. But we're seeing, after those changes, significant resegregation. Okay? And we're seeing this not just in Charlotte, but all across the country on average. And so what the next chapter then goes forth to try to examine is, what have been the educational consequences of this resegregation? Now, by resegregation, what I mean is, Today, when you look at segregation plans, uh, um, patterns of segregation, all of the increased economic segregation by class is all concentrated among families with school children. And it's most concentrated among families with preschool and K-12 children. So that is only reflecting the fact that parents are in search to have the best quality school system. And they don't really care what color as much as they care about the quality of provision of schools. Okay? Now, we like diversity as a priority. And actually, equity, diversity, and excellence are not in opposition. They're actually something that can be leveraged to elevate everybody's performance. And that's what we're going to talk about. But what I just want to say is simply that if you look at the 0.8 dissimilarity index, that's saying 80% of black preschool children would have to move to a different school within the district for there to be racial balance. That's not that much different than what I was showing you in 1970. Okay? That's what I mean by two steps forward, but we've definitely taken a step back. So what we want to think about, just to give, give you a sense of what the educational consequences have been. Okay? Before I just say that, let me just say one quick thing. When we have a release of court orders, one of the things that districts have been proactive about in some places is to recognize that a 
return to neighborhood schools is definitely going to be a return to more segregated schools. Okay? But some districts have been proactive to then have a resource allocation formula that puts more investments in those more segregated schools within the district. And that can go a long way to offset hyper-segregated schools. But I also want to offer, and I have research on the effects of school spending, so I, I do believe that, but I also want to offer that it's a very expensive way to deal with the problems of integrated schooling. Like, funding alone is not going to solve that. And even if it could, the amount of funding that would be necessary to overcome concentrated disadvantage is not in the interest of any district. So let's just look and see. Thank you. OK, so I, I just know because I need to shut this down, me, my talking part. So I'm just trying to get to the end very, as quickly as I can just so that we can make time for the broader conversation that's very important. So one of the things I do is link the children, again, who've been born since 1980, but who were in districts that were previously under a court order. And what you see among black children is before the release of court orders, their trajectory of improvement in high school graduation rates was improving. Like a two percentage point increase in high school graduation rates with each year of exposure to desegregated schools. Okay? You can see that here. It's statistically significant. What I have in red here is the year age 17 minus the year of the release of the court order. So whenever that's negative, it means you're exposed to an integrated school because of the court order. And when it's on the other side of the red, it represents now you're released from the court order, and how many years have you been released from the court order? Does that make sense? Same thing in reverse. So what I want you to see is we were making progress for African Americans. Flatlined. Okay. Now all of that, that's just showing you is that the distribution of school quality is not just about school funding equity. It's about teacher quality. It's about so many things. OK? So, so many things that, in the interest of time, I'm going to allow you to tell me more than I'm going to tell you. But it means a lot. And what we need to understand is these have implications for the ed educational opportunity. Finally, when we look for impacts on whites, we don't see a real structural break in the trend. The confidence intervals are not statistically similar. For African Americans, we see a major change that stopped the progress. Okay, now let's just look at where we are with Charlotte and I'll stop, okay? Charlotte, dissimilarity index, many in this room know this work much better than I. But what we can say is in 1980, we were a very integrated school system. By 2010, and I want you to note the increase in segregation following the 2001 release of court order, and I want you to notice the 1991 change in the busing. And I'm not saying we need to return to busing. That's not what my advocacy position is. But I am saying segregation is not the weather. This didn't just happen by itself. This is not an uncontrollable force. This is something that was occurring because of policy either action or sometimes policy inaction. This community cares, so there's a way forward. Okay. But look at 2001. This is the number of schools in red where there is more than 80% of children who are of a minority and 80% who are poor children. So there was only, I don't know, 10 of those dots, many more of those dots in 2013. Okay? Now, the point is, if you look across the state, the economic, remember I, I made a point that it's the divide by class that's some of the posing the greatest risk of equal educational opportunity. You can see certainly in Charlotte-Mecklenburg, it's among the most unequal along class lines. Okay? Now, that, that is not how it was in 1994, and different counties pursued different strategies to deal with that. And what we want to do is think and reconsider and reassess whether the existing policy needs to be rethought, giving the changing landscape and challenges ahead. So 
I've said a lot. I want to engage you. I want to hear from you, and I'm looking forward to learning what we can learn together to make educational opportunity a reality for all children. Thank you very much. All I can say is that is a tough act to follow, but we will do our best. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that Rucker is an economist. And Rucker shared with us, let me get one more chair. He shared with us the data on what happens when you have unequal per pupil spending, uh, preschool benefits aren't available to all, long care health improvements, graduation rates, long term income achievement. These are all things that we could talk about because there are many different factors that really matter. But what we want to talk about tonight is we want to talk about the pupil assignment plan. And we have a great panel with us tonight. And at this time, if we could get one more chair for our panel, it's right behind us. Uh, we're going to ask our panelists to come up and uh, if we could have our tech guys to help mic them up. So panelists, come on up and I will introduce you. Audience, at this time, I want to remind you that in your program, you have index cards. If you have a question you would like to ask the panel, if you have written your question on the index card, please pass the index cards to the aisle. Amy and some of our staff will be collecting them in just a moment. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and get started. And we're going to start by asking, I'm going to ask you to reach into your programs and follow along with me. Our panel to my left, Julian Wright. Julian Wright is an attorney here in Charlotte. Julian served on the Equity Committee for several years in CMS. Julian has two children that have graduated from CMS, one that's currently in CMS today. Uh, he is very actively involved in numerous activities uh, involving education in our community. Uh, on the other side of Rucker is Dr. Ophelia Garman Brown. Dr. Brown is a physician. She is a minister. She is a community activist. She serves on the Board of Governance for Project Lift, and she is currently the co-chair of the Opportunity Task Force. And the Opportunity Task Force is directly linked to the Chetty study. It's wonderful to hear Dr. Rucker, Dr. Johnson talk about the Chetty study because it's something that was brought to our attention a year ago, and it's something we're clearly not proud of. Uh, Charlotte considers itself a can-do city, and to be 50th out of 50 cities and upward mobility is something that we need to pay close attention to. Next to Ophelia is Rosie Molinari. Rosie Molinari is a community leader. She is a author. She takes special interest in Latinas. She started an organization called Circle de Luz where she takes these young women and helps them to think about hope, what can be. She's also involved in numerous other community uh, organizations that, to help the less fortunate. <clears throat> Last but not least is Ivan Lowe. Ivan Lowe is a community leader. He's the department chair for York Technical College. Uh, his wife is a CMS principal. He has two sons who graduated from CMS, and he has a daughter in elementary school now. Rosie also has a kindergartner or first grader? First grader. First grader at Davidson Elementary. So we have a great panel, and if you could get your questions, I'm going to start with the first question tonight. And also, I want to remind everyone that at the end of the evening, we are going to use Poll Everywhere. Poll Everywhere is a tool where you use your cell phone, and you're able to text in your answer, and the answers will then be uh, in front of all of us. So we'll end with that. Um, our first question for the night, for tonight, and I'd like to ask uh, all of our panelists to answer this one. The order will go in will be Ophelia, Julian, Rosie, and then Ivan. The question is, to what extent and how do Dr. Johnson's remarks tell us something we need to know about our community's future? Ophelia? Well, first of all, I want to say thank you. Wow. It's um, <laughs> what you can put together in terms of uh, all of that information was pretty amazing. Being the person who is uh, working with the task force mm -hmm. um, and the Chetty study that some of those slides that you show were familiar to mm -hmm. me, the five things that were not um, 
causal in particular, but related, mm -hmm. had to do with segregation, had to do with school, had to do with income inequality, mm -hmm. had to do with family structure, had mm -hmm. to do with social capital. Mm -hmm. And I think that you did an amazing job of, of, of really hitting all of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And I think what you have shared with us is, um, is in some ways some of the things that we know and I want to um, put to uh, the folks that are here in our community is what do we have the fortitude to do? What c courage do we have mm -hmm. to do to do the kinds of things that mm -hmm. uh, we know we need to do? I think it, the information that I heard tonight tells me that the status quo doesn't get it done and that there are too many uh, children, too many parts of our community um, that where educational efficacy isn't happening and it needs to happen more um, in more and more areas. It's also interesting to me that as much of a difference as money and resources can make, what I hear and what our community needs to hear is that money alone doesn't do it. 1.3 per free and reduced lunch child isn't enough to get it done. Um, you've got to have more than that in terms of quality of teachers. And what I'm intrigued to hear more about is, is not just peer competition and peer status, but more higher expectations. How do you build a community around each school that elevates those expectations and makes each of those schools effective? Um, that's what I'd like to try to explore more about and try to figure out. Resi? Um, I think that to build off of that, what's really interesting to me is this idea that it's not a zero-sum game, and we think it, it's a mistake to consider this an issue for people of color. It's an issue for all of us, and we have to find a way to have this conversation that it compels people who feel like, oh, it doesn't impact the child in my house. It impacts mm -hmm. every child, and it impacts those children becoming our workforce later on, and, and finding the way to have a conversation mm -hmm. that compels everyone to engage and to really consider what their contribution will be to making our community exceptional. Okay. Thank you. Ivan. When Dr. Johnson, I really enjoy, um, I really appreciate everything that you shared, but I, hopefully I can articulate my thoughts because I'm still looking at all those statistics, all those numbers, but I'll do the best I can. Um, I think I really get how there's a correlation of academic gain when you look at the Head Start programs and you look at the funding and, and, um, and all those things, the desegregation. But I think for me, I wanted to have my kids go to school and get an education that best meet their needs. That was my priority. Not so much the, the, the desegregation, while that is important. I think parents just want their kids to have an education that's gonna meet their individual needs. And I definitely stand strong on that. And my thing is, is that there's a thing called process and it's synonymous with time. Any process you have is gonna take time for that process to come to fruition, whatever it is you, uh, whatever it is you're trying to do. And so my thing is, is that we need to take a look at some supplemental things that we can do to help our kids get a good quality education. Um, fortunately, my wife has been a principal at four, three, four different schools. The community partnerships really made a difference with a lot of these inner city Title I schools. And it's my hope that every single person in this room could say that at some point in time, from when August, when school started in August up until this point in time, they at least volunteered one hour of their time in one of these schools. I agree with that. These churches have a lot of power. Our church, Ebenezer, Ebenezer Baptist Church, we have a partnership with Winding Springs Elementary and Weakland. We mentor those kids. And so we have to take a look at the supplemental things. We need to get the community involved. They need to go read to these elementary age kids. They need to mentor them. Because of the type of work that I do, and I work out of town, I try to get kids on the, on the, the tail end and in the evening hours. I can't be there during the day sometime, but I tell you what, I made a vested interest in coaching a lot of inner city kids in AAU basketball. And so if they're clowning in school, I'm in contact with the teacher. Mm -hmm. So when the, the game starts and they've been clowning in school, I let them dress out, I let them warm up in the layup line, but when the game starts, they're sitting on that bench. Mm -hmm. So now 
that's helping them do better in school yeah. because that's something the kids love to enjoy, especially our young black kids. They love sports. But my thing is, is that until we can get the, the funding, um, more quality with the funding and more desegregation, all those kinds of things, our community to get, needs to get involved with these schools. So let's move on. We are here tonight. We're here to, we're gonna, we're gonna try to solve, try to offer solutions, try to offer suggestions. The school board elections took place a week ago. Uh, we have our newest school board member, Elise Dashu, here with us tonight. We have a number of school board members here with us tonight. Our goal is to try to provide them with some solutions as we go forward with this. And we'll start with the first question and I'd like for Ophelia and Julian. To oh, okay. Okay. Actually, this one's to Rucker. Sorry, panel. Right. <laughs> we you, want to hear more too. <laughs> can you talk about the charter school movement and how the notions of choice and competition, uh, key elements, principles of quasi-market education, impact levels of segregation? Okay, that's a good question. So I, I do think that the, you know, the genesis of these ideas as solutions come from the view that public schools are a monopoly and therefore monopolies tend to be less cost conscious, less quality conscious, and that somehow competition and infusing competition will infuse more innovation and in teaching practices and will bring more accountability to failing schools. That, that, that's kind of using a market metaphor for improvement. And as an economist, I, I can appreciate like where it comes from, but at the same time, I think there are aspects of the education system that are less about people shirking their job and not trying to do the best they can, and more about like just not knowing how to improve things and not having the necessary support. So let's just consider like the fact that we have 3.1 million teachers, okay, in front of the classrooms. Let's not confuse the fact that no matter what kind of choice system, remember the choice system in expanding choice, it's like without a prescription. So you're left as a parent to try to navigate like where I should be looking for quality. That then puts more attention on test scores and more narrow outcome measures because you don't know how to take in what quality looks like. So it, it puts the onus on parents to navigate a very complex system that leads to greater segregation by both class and race. So I agree with the choice piece and expanding choice, but I don't think that it's any kind of panacea. And the unevenness in charter school quality is almost more uneven than the traditional public schools. And I do have a concern that the way in which that is sacrificing the actual quality of provision of traditional public schools is sometimes a lost, unintended consequence. So I think my whole thing first is to say teacher quality is still the most central aspect of quality school, and everything else is actually a distraction if we don't do something to try to promote professional development and support our teachers in the best way. And I understand merit-based pay, you know, there's definitely a pushback against that because it focuses too much on test scores. But I also still think that without merit-based pay, it can be more difficult to attract and retain the highest quality teachers in some of the most disadvantaged school environments. Uh, I, I, would, I would agree with that, but I, I think it's also important to note that CMS does not have any taxing authority. And CMS as a district can't control teacher salaries. But what we can control, what our school board can control, is they can con control pupil assignment. Um, this is a question for everyone on the panel. If you could make one suggestion, what would it be to the school board when they start looking at pupil assignment that might be the most effective to increase, you know, right now we have, we have some schools that are 99% uh, children living in poverty. What would be the one thing that you might offer the school board 
as a suggestion to change some of these people assignment numbers so we don't have the schools with the extreme high poverty student base, student population. And we can start with Julian, and I think all of you, if you can answer that, Ophelia, Rosie, and then Ivan. Do the math and do what's realistic. Uh, in the mayoral campaign, it wasn't lost on me that you can't go back to Wake County in the early 2000s and say we're going to set a cap and say that no school is going to have more than 45 percent free and reduced lunch population if you have a system-wide population that's closer to 60 percent. So you, you, you can't go back and, and do what history will not let you do regardless of how good the DeLorean works. <laughs> um, on the other hand, you can look at where you are, and if 99 percent free and reduced lunch populations in schools, if we agree that that's a significant problem and you want to do something about it, and you agree that, okay, you can do Herculean efforts with Project Lift and you can take tons of money and, and apply that to the problem and see if that does it, I'm not persuaded that does it. Have the courage and the long-term view as a school board to look at whether or not it doesn't make sense to cap the heavy, heavy concentrations of poverty that we have in too many schools and get some smarter folks than I am and figure out what that number is going to be. Is it 60 percent, 65, 70? But come up with a cap that's reasonable and that's workable that doesn't require you to, to, to alienate the community by totally revamping busing, but at the same time creates situations where you create opportunities for success and you, and you don't have to deal with the situations of such dire, dire concentrations of poverty. You know, it's often thought that uh, busing is basically for the poor child that's being bused to somewhere else. But busing or, and, and, and I am on the fence in, in reference to busing. I, I want there to be more uh, integration, uh, less uh, uh, segregation. Um, how to get there, I don't know that I can, I can give that answer. But I do know that when we are together, that the white child who is affluent, that has the opportunity to be with the black child who may be living in poverty, that has learned a whole lot more about how to navigate life and how to survive and how to be a winner. In, in situations where winning, you would think, wouldn't happen because of circumstances, can learn an awful lot. So I, I, I always want us to be reminded that this is just a two-way street here. It's not just that we're taking kids that we, we feel like um, we'll, if they go somewhere else, they'll be better. But everybody's better uh, in this situation. Yes. But in, in the meantime, I, I, I agree with you, there has to be a meantime situation. And I think in the meantime, we need to, the, one of the things that really impacted me in terms of your, your information with the finances is that when we looked at the need for finances for the schools that were in predominantly poor and subsequently African American, uh, Latino communities, that was where the monies needed to really go. Well, the money should have been there already. If the monies had been there, if we had been really taking seriously the needs of those schools, then those schools would have had more of what they needed to be the best schools in the world. We know what a good community looks like. We know what it takes to have a great community and a great school. Why don't we do that? When you look at our schools, some of the worst teachers in our school system are at our high poverty schools. Some of the best teachers in our school system are at our schools of affluence. We could, as you said, teacher principal is critical. So there's some low hanging fruit that we can do right now as we work on the overall plan. And I would love to see that happen. I, I'm a former CMS teacher. I now teach at UNC Charlotte. Um, but one of the things, as you were speaking, that struck me was I think what makes, sometimes we get mistaken about what makes a teacher effective. And we think that what makes a teacher effective, the proof is in their test scores. And I was told really early on in my teaching career, and it became sort of the most influential thing in how I show up in my classroom even today was that powerful learning happens with an emotional connection. Absolutely. And when I, I happened to teach predominantly US history at the time, which was a course that my students needed in order to become seniors in high school. And 
I wanted them to become seniors in high school. And so the way that I looked at that was perhaps on any given day of the 34 students that were walking into my classroom, one of them was particularly excited about US history and the other 33 were like, woman, what are you going to do for the next 90 minutes to entertain me? <laughs> and what I realized was, OK, there's one kid who has an emotional connection to US history. The other 33 needs something else to connect to, and it needs to be me. And that my responsibility is to make every single one of them feel connected to That's me good. so that they learn what they need to learn mm -hmm. to accomplish what they need to accomplish. And that was about creating a particular culture in our classroom. Mm -hmm. And so they look forward to coming to our 90 minutes because mm -hmm. of the culture we created in our classroom and what that was. And so I think about that even in thinking about the school board question, which is um, we're going to have to make some decisions for forward prog progress that may not make people comfortable and that may make people feel like their family is being asked to do something that's more than they want their family to be asked to do. And so I think it's really important in every step of that action and decision making process to think about the emotional connection for everybody who sort of shows up at the table or who writes a letter to the editor who's just not feeling what the decisions that are being made. I think it's really important to think about how do we create relevance in the situation to every single person, especially especially the people who don't think that this is their problem and it's not influencing them. And that's a real um, task of leadership. But I think in the midst of doing the math and figuring out the metrics and talking about what short-term solutions there are, we also have to figure out a way to be emotionally connected as a community so that we all recognize that this matters. Thank you. Okay. My, res my response is somewhat concise, um, similar to Julian. Um, if, we, if there's a way we could cap, you know, the uh, free and reduced uh, students to have them um, bust to another uh, district as far as you possibly can out that will bring more diversity. Um, but there's so many things that you would have to consider. I mean, you know, you, you, you got to take a look at exactly how far out you can redistribute those students to bring or to ensure some diversity and those kinds of things because you know you don't you can't take a student and bust them from uh, the university area to the Ballantyne area. I mean you'd have to get up so early and you got to look at the shuttle. However, the we shuttle. do that now with our magnet schools. Right. Okay. Right. But um, but yeah, but you got to take a look at um, you know the how early they would have to get right. up to go to the shuttle stop to be transferred out and those kinds of things. But if it was if if I had a wish, it would be able to cap the, the percentage of free and reduced students and place them at a school as far out as you possibly can to that community school to bring some degree of diversity. I Bill, think it, so. go ahead. Bill, you made a point that we do that now with our magnet schools, and you know this better than, it, than, than I. We're doing more busing now than we did when we had court order busing. Is that correct? That's correct. Buses run more miles today than they did when we had court ordered busing, yes. Uh, Amy brought that up in her, in this very room back in yeah. May when we did yeah. the Dream Long Deferred, yeah. and there was a, a collective, ah, oh, really? Yeah. But yes, we do. So it's yep. just done a little differently. It yeah. feels different too because people are electing, Correct. right? So they don't feel done. Correct. Mm -hmm. So they have that emotional attachment. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is the problem with these types of events is that you never have enough time to get through all the questions and you never have enough, enough time. So we get your phones out. And if you have text messaging abilities in your phones, <laughs> we're now going to use Poll Everywhere. Uh, Poll Everywhere is a tool that's going to give you an opportunity to answer the question above. And the question is, throughout the county, we have witnessed a systematic regression of segregated schools. What steps are necessary to prevent this regression as the school board implements its new pupil assignment plan? Uh, where it says two is you put the number in, 37607, and then in the body of the message, you're going to put COE outreach space and then your answer. So we want to hear from you. It takes a couple minutes for the first ones to roll up, but again, it's two, 37607. And then down in the message, you're going to do COE outreach and space, and then start typing in your suggestion. Yes, sir. 
package. You know, dissemination mm -hmm. of reference. Yeah. Research. Yeah. Courage. That's a great point somebody just made. Yep. Great point. We'll sneak over there with you. Yeah. That's a great Community buy-in, this is everyone's problem, or everyone's opportunity. Yes. Political will, I think they're talking to the school board members there. <laughs> <laughs> intestinal fortitude. As you can see, we have, we have people here that care. Tonight, we have the people in our community, and I must say it's really encouraging because a lot of these events, it's the same faces. Tonight, it's a very diverse group of individuals. We're very pleased that so many of you came out tonight. This is going to be an ongoing discussion, and I think that we really need to support our school board as we go forward. This is going to be difficult. I think Ruck Rucker's words ring true. It's not just one thing. It's not just about um, how we develop our pupil assignment plan. It's about our housing patterns. It's about preschool. It's about teacher salary. It's about health care. It's about a number of things. And we all vote. So we need to remember that and we need to encourage all of our friends and family to have that political will and have the courage we need to make change. On behalf of the University of North Carolina College of Education and the Levine Museum of the New South, we thank all of you for being here tonight, and let's keep the conversation going. Thank you very much.